Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's really so nice to see you all. Uh, and uh, it's been a really fun day for me. I hope you all had a good time so far. Let me more officially welcome you to NWU uh, outside of breakfast this morning uh, to Tucson uh, and to the University of Arizona. Uh, and this conference, uh, which again is sponsored by uh, the Wayne Beach Rehnquist Center on the Constitutional Structures of Government, uh, uh, it's full which I'm required to use in settings like uh, this one. Uh, I'm extremely pleased uh, to welcome uh, you all uh, and uh, welcome our keynote speaker this afternoon, uh, Richard Gray, professor of law at the University of uh, Virginia. Uh, I was thinking about how I might introduce Richard this afternoon, and I remembered uh, that he gave uh, the very first faculty workshop that I attended after joining uh, the faculty here at Arizona I believe in his first year uh, as a law professor uh, at UCLA. Uh, uh, and uh, in the ensuing years, uh, uh, in my view, certainly he has become uh, one of the most interesting, one of the most prolific uh, law scholars in the country, writing on subjects uh, as varied as judicial precedent uh, in a lot of different uh, guises, uh, starting decisis, judicial rhetoric, uh, <coughs> Fourth Amendment, national interpretation, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, and uh, much more, uh, but apparently it has all uh, been leading up to today. Uh, <laughs> tell us what the one big question <laughs> is. So, with that, I'll turn it over to Richard. I will keep the queue after so I can speak for about 30 minutes. Uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction, uh, Andy. We go back a long way and I've benefited from a lot of your thoughts over the years. Uh, and it's especially gratifying for me to be giving this uh, keynote, which I'm so thrilled and honored to be doing, because not that long ago I was presenting a paper on a panel here, and not long after that I was commenting on a panel here. So now I have the, the additional honor and privilege of being able to share a few thoughts uh, with all of you today. And my starting point is an observation that I think is in common with a number of comments I've heard in earlier panels at this conference today, also some of my predecessors at this podium have begun with this observation. And that is the fact that we live in a time of remarkable polarization in our legal culture. And that polarization is posing special problems for the project of constitutional law and more generally for the project of public law. And my goal here is to offer a hopefully realistic but also optimistic take on our uh, difficult situation. And the way that I want to do that is by focusing on this now much uh, anticipated one big question. I know all of you are waiting for the, the answer to the, what is the question. Uh, so I'm just going to start off by telling you what the question I have in mind is. And that is whether courts, especially the US Supreme Court, should have a lot of power. Uh, and I think that question is uh, shaping legal culture today in a way that is uh, distinctive across decades. To understand why, let me start by talking about a little bit of history, kind of recent history. For most of our professional lives, both the left and the right have had something to gain and something to fear when it came to the Supreme Court. That was because key justices, such as Justices Powell, O'Connor, and Kennedy, were unpredictable or persuadable on a number of politically salient issues. So the relevant time period I'm talking about here stretches from roughly the early 1970s to the mid-20-teens. And so uh, a few years ago at this podium, David Strauss summarized the constitutional gestalt during the late 20th century roughly by saying uh, a few simple words, Wagner bad, Brown good. As he put it, that's constitutional law. <laughs> and I think that may sound like a simple slogan to many of us, but it hides a lot of complexity. It actually takes some work to explain how both of those propositions can be true, and doing so accordingly occupied a whole lot of sophisticated legal reasoning and thinking. But while that challenge was tricky enough, each wing of legal culture, I think, actually faced its own special and even more daunting challenge. For conservatives, the question was, how can we oppose Roe v. Wade, but keep Brown versus Board of Education? And for liberals, the question was, how can we support Roe v. Wade, but reject Lochner versus New York? Now, a simple-minded person might think you can't have your constitutional cake and eat it too. On that straightforward and maybe overly simple view, Original critics of Roe should simply reject Brown, and small d Democratic opponents of Lochner should simply reject Roe. After all, Brown overturned historical practices that dated back to the 14th Amendment's ratification, and Roe recognized a novel right that substantially impinged on the democratic process. Nonetheless, legal thinkers found ways to reject those simple conclusions. So a felt need to square logical circles 
generated an acute demand for sophisticated legal reasoning. Constitutional law sophistication was accompanied by another closely related trait that I've already alluded to, and that's unpredictability. In recent decades, how the court would rule in many politically salient cases was hard to predict years in advance. Just think of the anticipation before Planned Parenthood v. Casey, Gardner v. Bollinger, or Murphy v. Hodges. Again, this unpredictability stemmed partly from how hard it was to predict certain media injustices' views, but it also partly stemmed from the difficulty of foreseeing future judicial appointments. The court often seemed just one vote or one new appointment away from flipping on major issues. The result was a lot of drama, not only during confirmation hearings and within lines of doctrine, but also in individual cases. Legal argument accordingly featured nuance, paradox, creativity, and even suspense. Now, people didn't always like all this drama. I'm sure many of you can remember various times not liking it yourselves. Many critics bemoan the media injustice of the day. In hindsight, however, I think that constitutional law's unpredictability and sophistication look more salutary and perhaps even essential. For one thing, legal complexity creates a gap between legal reasoning and political reasoning. This point is usually overlooked because it applies only in hard legal cases. In an easy legal case, the existence of legal rules alone is enough to create separation between laws and politics. For example, if the speed limit is 35 or if the HP president at a minimum is 35, we can apprehend that kind of norm right away without thinking about ideology. But when we talk about more indeterminate cases, like the meaning of terms like equality or freedom or the concept of tending those terms, then the legal norm itself no longer has sufficient determinate meaning alone to create separation between law and politics. It could turn out, for example, that people of a certain ideological persuasion think that equality and freedom means the things that they like, and the opposite ideological persuasion may think the opposite, and there may be no legal way to adjudicate who in that dispute is right or wrong. Now, political scientists have pointed out that courts garner public legitimacy when their rulings cut across political fault lines. If both sides of the political spectrum have something to gain from appealing to the courts, then neither has a strong interest in dismantling them. Political actors will then have an incentive to buttress judicial legitimacy, or at least not tear it down. Consistent with that view, judicial legitimacy flourished during the Berger and Rehnquist courts. But the combination of legal sophistication and unpredictability had an even more important effect. It sustained an independent legal culture. When courts might do any number of things based on esoteric reasons, there is every reason to argue in front of them on the court's own terms. And that means learning to speak and reason according to the sophisticated rules that courts employ. So when sophistication and unpredictability are present, the process of legal argument becomes self-legitimated. The law, as the court understands it, will thrive as a specialized mode of thinking and speaking. That, that's the old picture that I've just been describing. Recently, things have changed. There are now at least five, and probably six, committed conservatives on the US Supreme Court. These jurists don't seem nearly as persuadable or unpredictable as the median jurists of days gone by. Further, the jurists are actively monitoring lower courts on high salience issues. This new situation has effectively moved the horizon of legal debate. Unpredictability used to center on whether the court would be liberal, conservative, or something in between. Today, by contrast, unpredictability generally centers on just how far to the right the justices are prepared to go. So, if politics is our baseline, then the court is now far more predictable. And this relative predictability has knock-on effects for legal sophistication. In short, sophistication is now much less in demand. For many thinkers, there is basically just, and here it is, the one big question. Should federal judges, especially the US Supreme Court, have a lot of power? The answer for both left and right used to be, it's complicated. Now, however, there's a strong incentive for conservatives to simply say, yes, and for liberals simply to say, no. This situation calls to mind the Warren Court of the mid-1960s, except that the Prussians' ideological valence is flunked. And it turns out that many legal issues are downstream of the one big question. Both the left and the right are accordingly shifting their legal positions in light of their new answers to that question. Let me give you a few examples, all centering on Justices Scalia and Kagan. First, textualism. When Justice Scalia was an insurgent force in the federal judiciary, being a textualist meant shackling the purposive judicial activism characteristic of the 1970s. Today, by contrast, Justice Kagan often evokes textualism 
to take the Supreme Court's conservatives to task. Meanwhile, conservative legal intellectuals are increasingly talking about moving beyond textualism. Unwritten law is now hot in conservative legal circles. Second, agency deference. Justice Scalia supported judicial deference to agencies, not just under Chevron, but also under adjacent principles like our deference. But that process started when conservatives were a minority force on the judiciary, and President Carter's appointees led the D.C. Circuit. Today, with conservatives in command of the courts, Scalia's successors have turned sharply against agency deference. Meanwhile, Justice Kagan fights to preserve agency deference in cases like Kaiser and this term, Relentless and Loper Bright. Finally, standing. Scalia strove to tighten up standing rules as a way to curb liberal judicial activity. Profligate standing rules in the Establishment Clause context were perhaps a central example, as they facilitated what he viewed as excessive restrictions on religiosity. But conservative litigants now want access to the federal courts. They know that under new case law, they can receive relief or exemptions from many regulations. So it is now the left that has a special interest in enforcing or tightening up justiciability principles. Conservatives, by contrast, are tempted to fling open the courthouse doors. A single Supreme Court case recently illustrated all three of these trends. The student loan case, Biden v. Nebraska, featured several states arguing that the U.S. Secretary of Education lacked statutory authority to cancel student debt. Three questions arose. What did the statute mean? What attitude should the court take toward the Secretary's exercise of administrative authority? And should states have standing to challenge the loan forgiveness program, even though student debt relief had no direct effect on the state's treasuries? The court ended up divided six to three. Far from deferring to the Secretary, all six conservative justices invoked the atextual major questions doctrine to give narrow meaning to the statutory text. The conservatives also found standing on the theory that a loan service provider with no objection to the loan forgiveness plan was really part of the state. Therefore, the services lost business gave that state standing to challenge the entire nationwide loan forgiveness program. By contrast, all three liberal justices invoked textualism, exhibited respect bordering on deference for the executive agency's work, and rejected standing as too attenuated and artificial to, to sustain nationwide relief. In other words, the liberal justices were much more textualist, far more deferential to the executive branch, and markedly stricter when it came to standing than their conservative colleagues. This alignment of votes and views represents an almost complete inversion of the 1980s. A similar dynamic is visible in many other legal debates. Take the still live question of whether President Trump is disqualified from public office under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. You might think that liberal judges and commentators would unanimously answer yes, given their institutional incentives. But the one big question cuts strongly against that simple result. Many on the left have recently been advocating for a weaker Supreme Court and they have extolled democratic empowerment. Those views make it very hard to embrace judicial disqualification of a leading presidential candidate. For this reason, among others, the legal left was and remains divided on this topic. Now, the examples I've just given are doctrinal and fairly specific, but there's a broader, more theoretical implication of the one big question. In brief, conservative legal thought is, in certain key respects, becoming less formalist. And, as though in reciprocal exchange, liberal legal thought is becoming more formalist. In general, groups that are in power have reason to favor legal principles that foster discretion. Why would this be? Well, there can be important public interested reasons for this tendency. After all, the group in power has a responsibility to govern, and that means grappling with many real-world complexities that may be unexpected or contextual. Flexible rules and standards help with that challenge. By contrast, rigid rules are a liability to the governing coalition because they might prevent effective responses and mandate in affluence. But there are also more worrisome incentives at play. Most obviously, people who are in power have a self-interested reason to aggrandize their own power. Flexible legal principles fit that ambition quite nicely. Greater flexibility also enables those who are in power to gain even greater license in future cases to do what they really want to do. By contrast, groups who are out of power have a strong reason to insist on rigidity in legal precepts. Most importantly, strict rules contain the majority's discretion. Dissenters accordingly have a powerful incentive to encourage the majority to adopt strict rules. And to do that well, the dissenters themselves must espouse those rules. Moreover, a dissenter
center is generally rewarded for simplicity. She has an incentive to draw sharp contrasts between her side and her opponents. Only by condemning one's adversaries can the center rally supporters, because no one ever went to battle crying out, it's complicated. <laughs> it's a baby law question, I know. <laughs> Finally, the dissenter is freed from the burden of governing, and so it doesn't pay the price for simplified binary thinking. So in the new constitutional order, conservatives will feel pressure to see the virtues of legal flexibility, and many liberals will be inclined for the opposite transformation. This tendency helps to explain, for example, why conservatives are softening on strict textualism. Atextual and Textual principles are becoming more popular on the right, with the major questions doctrine being only the most salient example. And again, Justice Kagan sometimes sounds like a textualist in the model of Justice Scalia. Or take the conservative turn against Chevron deference. A Chevron critic who is also an arch formalist might take the view that Chevron was always wrong. The fact that conservatives fell in and then out of love with that doctrine would be irrelevant or merely coincidental. By contrast, a less formalist legal thinker might believe that Chevron was originally correct, but that it was contingently so. The lessons of experience, perhaps, may have shown that a doctrinal adjustment that worked well in the 1980s, in the Chevron deference, no longer fits the times, and therefore needs a sharp correction. On this view, Chevron was right for its time, but it's not right for our own. That sort of interpretive dynamism is more readily associated for many of us with legal functionalists rather than self-proclaimed originalists. Yet, in the relentless and low right arguments earlier this term, it was the conservative originalists, not their liberal colleagues, who were receptive to this kind of argument. A similar trend is also visible in Second Amendment cases. In Bruin, Justice Thomas wrote an opinion consistent with his longtime dissident conservatism. The gist of the opinion seemed to be that firearms regulations were unconstitutional unless they had a clear historical antecedent. <coughs> That is a strict, inflexible rubric, the kind of thing that a dissenter can argue with a plumb. But it is too inflexible to be a workable way of administering the Constitution's right to bear arms, as the lower court soon revealed. This term, in the United States versus Rahimi, the court is considering a case involving restrictions on firearms possessed by persons under restraining orders for domestic violence. There is no clear historical antecedent for such a restriction. The very concept legally of domestic violence is, in historical terms, fairly new. Yet the appeal of this protective restriction is obvious, as most, if not all, the justices recognize that oral argument. By all appearances, then, the justices will add some flexibility to Bruin's Second Amendment analysis, loosening its formalism by one or two notches. A dissident methodology is thus adapted to the challenges posed by actual governments. Of course, many in this room would argue that ostensibly formal methods were always packed with concealed or denied discretion. What I am suggesting is that the right is becoming increasingly comfortable and open when it comes to interpretive discretion, and the left much less so. You might also wonder whether either the left or the right actually cares about its rules or its stated principles at all. Maybe various types of bias or the unique features of individual cases drive most or all actual judicial outcomes rendering legal rules, at least formally legal rules, mostly relevant. The law then can turn out to be influenced uh, not just by politics, but fully determined by the politics of the moment. That kind of skepticism about law has been commonplace at least since the heyday of legal realism roughly a century ago. Now, to explore this concern, I'd like to again visit the student loan case. As I mentioned before, Justice Kagan emphasized textualist principles to oppose the major questions doctrine, and her argument struck a nerve with Justice Barrett. As a law professor, Justice Barrett has expressed strongly textualist views, and she was also skeptical of substantive canons of interpretation. Were those long-standing views of hers compatible with the Supreme Court's new major questions doctrine? In the student loan case, Barrett wrote a concurrence arguing that the answer was yes. From one standpoint, Barrett's concurrence shows the fragility of a judge's rules and the validity of rule skepticism. That is because, at least on my view, Barrett's concurrence was unpersuasive. For example, Barrett appealed directly to common sense, her phrase, even though textualism had long been thought to foreclose exactly that kind of appeal. Making matters worse, the sense that Barrett appealed to wasn't actually common at all. She instead espoused controversial intuitions and then attributed them to the statute. I therefore conclude that Barrett failed to square the new concurrence with her prior writings. But even if so, Barrett's struggle still mattered in two very important ways. First, 
Her attempt to remain faithful to her earlier writings prompted her to adopt a relatively mild and contextual version of the major questions doctrine. Whereas some justices view that doctrine as a powerful clear statement rule and cast it as having constitutional underpinnings, Barrett viewed it as a relatively subtle aid to ascertaining legislative meaning. So Barrett's academic backstory for personal rules meaningfully affected her judicial views. Second, and more fundamentally, Barrett's choice to write a concurrence at all illustrates that she and other justices want to hold coherent legal views. She could have chosen to join the majority opinion without comment, as she had done in earlier major questions cases. By instead attempting to express her views in a systematic way, Barrett exposed herself to criticism, including the criticism that I have just lodged against her. Barrett's evident desire not only to be consistent, but to demonstrate her consistency publicly suggests that legal reasoning continues to matter. Barrett had to get pretty sophisticated to square a circle within her own legal thought. The tension that Barrett experienced between her previously published views and her new rulings suggests an abiding gap between law and politics. The one big question may be the single biggest driver of legal views today, but it still isn't the only such force, and it isn't even an overwhelmingly dominant force. Because people care about personal consistency, constitutional law, thankfully, has not yet devolved into either judicial whimsy or hackery. Even as I say that, I find myself embracing the podium a little bit. <laughs> Moreover, legal actors generally recognize the power of personal consistency. The student loan case is once again a great example. In all likelihood, Justice Barrett's concurrence was prompted, at least in part, by textual arguments previously leveled by Justice Kagan. In some past cases, Kagan's indictments seemed to echo points that Barrett herself had personally made in her published writings. In an oral argument, for instance, Kagan once asserted that substantive canons might be categorically illegitimate, an extraordinarily strict textualist position that also happened to be the very possibility that motivated one of Barrett's articles. Those criticisms landed for Barrett, and she sought to address them. Uh, I think that speaks well of uh, Justice Barrett as a jurist. In that context, consider Justice Kagan's response to Justice Barrett's concurrence in the student loan case. Rather than rebuke Barrett for betraying her textualist principles, Kagan praised Barrett's concurrence as thoughtful and emphasized its similarity to Kagan's own reasoning. Kagan's reaction to Barrett illustrates the consolidation of a new legal regime, one in which conservative legal rules predominate. With the new regime in place, the dissenters are left to engage in resistance within it. The rules of the game have changed, but there are still rules. In this way, constitutional law, thankfully, lives on. One might think that the dissenters, Kagan included, should refrain from adopting the views of their opponents. To do so could seem hypocritical or insincere, and at any rate, assimilating the erstwhile views of your ideological adversaries forgoes the opportunity to make your own authentic and more visionary jurisprudence. Why engage in trench warfare with the jurisprudence in power when you can fashion your own jurisprudence in exile just waiting to be installed at a future time? To some extent, left thinkers and judges are indeed engaged in a project of authentic jurisprudential imagination. In that respect, the left is imitating Justices Scalia and Thomas from the 1990s, or Justices Brennan and Marshall from the 1980s. And in some form, I think that effort is entirely pro uh, proper. At the same time, it is the dissenter's privilege, and to some extent, the dissenter's obligation or responsibility to absorb and enforce the long-standing views of a new governing majority. The new majority, after all, is making consequential decisions and fashioning precedent. To ignore those rulings is to ignore the law as it is today. And by frequently engaging the majority on its own terms, the dissenters are not just seeking out wins in individual cases, which they sometimes do. They are also fostering sophistication and helping to preserve the gap between law and politics. They are doing their part to prop up the rule of law in a turbulent time. Because justices like Barrett and Kagan care about personal consistency, both their own and one another's, an interstitial complexity still adheres in the myriad choices to invoke, adjust, or abandon old rules. There, even in the time of the one big question, constitutional reasoning lives on, separate from politics. Okay, I said a lot of things. At this point, I think it's high time to talk about the legal academy's role in all this. Where does scholarship fit in? Every scholar's question. How can the many brilliant and talented minds in this room improve the current legal situation? One possible answer is there's basically nothing for us to do. <laughs> <laughs> if judicial power is the main driver of case law, then only a political shift could bring fundamental change. 
New presidents and senates will eventually select new justices, altering the current conservative supermajority on the Supreme Court. Changes in judicial personnel, in other words, will slowly bring about new legal practices. Related but distinct from that, political drift might also cast the current justices in a novel role. That's because the legal rules that the justices accept today might no longer correspond so neatly with conservative legal views tomorrow. We might imagine, for example, that Congress came under the long-term control of uh, conservative political interests and started enacting a lot of ambitious conservative legislation. In that context, the current court's relatively narrow view of uh, federal legislative power might become uh, coded with the left. On this sort of view, the current legal regime will eventually be disrupted, but the key determinants of that outcome uh, will lie in political forum, not legal ones, and certainly not in constitutional uh, large articles or at wonderful conferences like this one. In the meantime, moreover, constitutional scholarship could itself become downstream of the one big question. In other words, legal scholars might increasingly ask, should federal courts, especially the US Supreme Court, have lots of power? Left scholars might increasingly say, no, leading them to support jurisdiction stripping, limited judicial review, stringent standing rules, deference to administrative agencies, and interpretive formalism. All views that were associated with legal conservatives within living memory. And indeed, many left scholars have done just this. Meanwhile, scholars who answer the same question with a yes, saying that courts should have lots of power, especially the US Supreme Court, would travel down the opposite path. For example, conservative scholars might become increasingly opposed to court reform, skeptical of administrative agencies, and equivocal about textualism. All views associated with the left within living memory. And here, too, many conservative scholars have acted in more or less this way, mirroring the views of many conservative judges. This point is not limited to the two doctrinal debates. Take the high jurisprudential question of what law is. For decades, conservatives were associated with legal positivism in at least three senses. They distinguished law from morality. They prioritized enacted law over, and even to the exclusion of, unwritten law. And they recognized indeterminacy in legal sources, including under doctrines like Chevron. Justice Scalia, who was an accomplished scholar both before and after he assumed the bench, is again a great example. By comparison, the last generation's most salient non-positivist was Ronald Dworkin, who blended texts, practices, and morality in ways that favored an explicitly Herculean judiciary with a decidedly liberal outlook. Today, however, conservative legal thought is markedly less positivist along all three dimensions I just described. Common good constitutionalism is merging law and morality in avowedly Dworkinian ways. <coughs> Conservative scholarship on both unwritten law and contextual interpretation is on the rise. And Dworkin's famous one right answer thesis, or something like it, is approaching conventional wisdom among a new generation of conservative legal thinkers. Now, to the extent that the trends I've outlined are true or real, is that a problem? Maybe not. As I described, legal reasoning can survive alongside the one big question. Of special note, there is still an intellectual struggle between legal thinkers who work within the reigning legal ideology and those who challenge or obstruct it. So even if constitutional scholarship were merely legal advocacy once removed, that role would still be a useful one. Yet I think that many scholars, many of us, aspire to be more than mere epiphenomena of political and legal controversies. Scholars, us, we are not just slow-working advocates with bigger word limits. <laughs> or at least we shouldn't be. Scholars instead aspire to find the truth with a capital T. And there are many ways for constitutional scholars to pursue that loftier role. Perhaps most obviously, scholars can conduct descriptive or empirical research of various types, such as historical inquiry or many other types, without regard to the research's legal ramifications. But that kind of scholarly work, while undoubtedly important and really invaluable in many ways, does not directly grapple with legal culture as it currently exists. So where advocacy-driven research may be too closely linked to ongoing controversies, descriptive detachment may turn out to be too aloof from actual practice to be completely satisfying. As you might guess, I'd like to draw attention to a third way forward. <laughs> Judges currently hold certain legal views, and for all intents and purposes, those views together constitute the law. But the views that judges hold are not generated at random. Some views are essentially off the table for everyone all the time. Other views tend to become popular only after others have fallen out of favor. And so other views are almost universally held among salient legal actors. So there is a deeper structure underlying the law at any given moment. 
one that helps explain who has which views, when they have those views, and why. The principles that govern this deeper structure could be viewed as a kind of natural law, or perhaps as chief evil. Or it could be viewed as the true law, the law of the law, as it were. For someone considering the law's underlying structure, there is no definitive or permanent answer to first-order legal questions. Is textualism correct? Should courts defer to administrative agencies? Should standing be strict or flexible? The law is instead viewed as a dynamic system in which different answers are possible and championed by different actors for different reasons at different junctures. And we can do much more than simply recognize that different answers to these questions are possible. For example, some of these answers may make more sense when held together. Certain combinations of legal principles can form equilibria, yielding stability, or disequilibria, yielding tumult. The approach that I'm outlining has much in common with well-known jurisprudential schools, such as legal realism, critical legal studies, and democratic constitutionalism. For instance, this approach views the law of the moment as linked to the personalities of individual judges, and it agrees that the political process substantially drives legal change. At the same time, this view also has a lot in common with traditional legal formalism. Legal principles on the view I'm outlining are viewed as having real practical effect and indeed as almost having a life of their own, independent of any particular individual or jurist. Even in appellate cases, moreover, this view maintains that there is genuine law. Thus, constitutional law abides even in 2024, even apart from politics. So, even in a time of the one big question, or especially in that time, constitutional scholarship can play an important role by mapping out the law's underlying structure. By exposing the contingency and the fluidity of constitutional law, scholars, those of us in this room, can illuminate the complexity imminent in our practices. And that effort, I think, will foster mutual understanding across the ideological divide that presently marks out our legal culture. In fact, for all its challenges, the present moment is actually an especially auspicious time to support the law's underlying structure. This is the optimism coming back. As I've argued, long-time formalists are coming to see the virtue in legal flexibility, and long-time functionalists are starting to be drawn toward legal formalism. As these two factions exchange positions, they will pass one another <coughs> near the center of the aisle. And one can hope, or at least I can hope, that each side will have a chance to see the other up close and more sympathetically. But there's an even more basic, fundamental way in which appreciating the law's structure can foster respect, toleration, and humility. Because if we agree that there's an underlying structure to our legal system, one that creates choices in addition to commandments, then each person's role within that complex system cannot be explained based on the Constitution's one true meaning. Instead, our various positions within that structure must be partly the result of forces beyond our control, along with, yes, the many critical choices that we make within that structure. If things had gone a bit differently, perhaps each of us would be holding quite different legal views. Adversaries could have been allies, and each side in a major controversy might have held the opposite position. In the speech, as you can tell, I've tried to take the law's underlying structure seriously, though I've only scratched the surface of these views. And of course, many of you have already done work in a similar spirit. If you found my rumination expression useful, then please think about adopting this sort of approach. And if you didn't find them fresh or useful, I'd be curious to hear about that too. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll take three questions at a time, and then let you should, uh, have an opportunity to respond. And if you could limit yourself to one question, we'll circle back to repeat questions if you have time. But I expect there will be uh, a lot of them. So, questions? Uh, Jacob, uh, Noah, and Ned. Um, uh, thank you so much for this, this, this great presentation, Richard. So I have a question. When did this become as it is, and I suppose not just from a descriptive standpoint, but when did it have to become this way? You, you really focused, I would say, on the lifetimes of most people in this room. I think you sort of reached back to the 1980s. Was did the court have this character starting with the Warren Court, with the Lochner Court, as soon as Justice Marshall decided to make Article Three as robust as it is? And um, maybe, maybe unless your answer to that question is highly contingent and historical, um, is this a universal quality of any judicial system that is sufficiently robust as a function of the unique U.S. constitutional setup, 
Um, I think England doesn't have these sort of the, the, the same types of struggles that you described, but they also have a judiciary that institutionally, by the constitutional arrangement, is in some ways much weaker, right? So I'm curious about what what aspects of the of, the, of your very kind of incisive description are contingent, and exactly what they're contingent on. Thank you. Uh, my question follows very much in the same vein. First, Richard, I just want to thank you. This was so thought-provoking and illuminating and genuinely mind-expanding. It was fantastic. But it, it, it picks up just where Jacob left off about the relationship between contingency and essentiality. So you end by adopting a viewpoint from which you can see the structure and encourage us to sort of enter into it in a way that stands outside of politics. Whereas your previous account is all about the way in which the opposition between Liberal, liberal political projects and conservative projects helps to structure the law itself. So putting on my, my, my historian's hat, we know that what it means to be a liberal or a conservative changes over time. So the propositional content of that position evolves. And it sounds like from your talk, you think that the relationship that those parties have to the law evolves with it, but it sounds like the structure of the law itself remains in some sense beyond this evolution. And so I was wondering if you could help me understand that. So is there this thing called the law that exists outside of the tension between the liberal and conservative projects to use the law for their ends? And a sort of subset of that question would be, is there something inherent about being liberal or conservative that leads you to think about the law in a particular way? And is that historical too? Or, or, or not is the truth that we can't occupy the position that you've seized at the end from which we can locate the liberals and conservatives within this field called the law. So um, I'd like you to uh, say a little bit more about um, Morkin and Hercules, or the potential relevance of that, because before you mentioned that, I was sort of formulating the question along the lines of, you know, what should a judge do, given all the, what you fantastically lay out? Like, how should a judge be the best optimal judge? And by that, try not to be pure politics, but to, to, to find you know, the, the legal truth, as it were. And if it turns out that Hercules is, you know, there's a Hercules on the left that was working, and now there's a Hercules on the right that is common law constitutionalism, is there no, you know, true Hercules? And what if, it, what if a newly appointed justice said, I really want to be the best justice I can be. I was lucky enough to be appointed, but my commitment now is to the law, not to the president that appointed me. How do I be it? Uh, the best judge I could be. Uh, I wasn't sure I yet heard an answer to that. Great, thank you, Olga. You did the questions kind of nicely progress, actually, to kind of analyze structure almost. That's, that's happily uh, coincidental, or was it the result of a deeper structure? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you did that. <laughs> um, uh, great, so uh, on the, the first set of comments um, regarding the, the degree of contingency. So, there are several different levels of abstraction in the picture that I very personally outlined here. I think at the most abstract level, I don't think it's particularly contingent. I mean, it's contingent on it being something that we could identify as a norm-based system of adjudication and power distribution. So it's contingent, you know, it's, it wouldn't apply if there were, you know, if there were no human beings, for example, or something like that, if there were like robots or something. But, okay, so there's like one sense in which there's a kind of a minimal, uh, kind of trivial contingency. Then you move to another example of, well, what about the UK, where you, are, you, pop, you posit, I'm just going to accept this, that if I understood you, that there's kind of a weaker judiciary, maybe it's more independent from politics. And certainly, I would more readily agree with that characterization of some other countries, that maybe not the UK quite so much, so it's maybe intermediate. Um, and so the question is, well, how does, this, how does the structure apply there? Well, I think that the idea of there being an underlying structure to be discovered, I think because that's you know, so similar to the situation we have now in, in the United States in many ways, I think there will be similarly underlying structure, but what the structure is will be shaped by the various institutional contingencies unique to that country. And I think that part of the reason that this kind of picture that I'm outlining, um, I think some people find it kind of jarring to think about this as a kind of legal question that I'm describing, is because many people, even in the US today, despite everything that's happened in legal culture in the last generation or two, uh, naturally assume a kind of simple model that is more like what what I understand to be the case in a country like Germany, or maybe your, your description in the UK, where um, where the judiciary is more peripheral, more uniform, more uh, esoteric, maybe more separate from politics. Right? So, if, whether that's a descriptively accurate statement of those countries, the more those variables are present, the more that my deeper structure it may be, it may still be true as a jurisprudential account, but it's less useful, it's less important, and so there's a separate kind of dimension of this inquiry, which is not you know it, it are my 
outputs you know, contingent for the truth value. There's another axis here, which is, well, are my outputs useful analytically or useful for, for people, for governments, for citizens? And I do think that on both of those dimensions, a lot of what I'm saying here is accentuated in the United States, but I wouldn't want to give it up as being relevant to a different system with different contingent features. So that's like a, an initial attempt to, to describe the different levels of, of contingency and the degree to which my count um, is. And I think I said this, just to make it really clear, the specific things that, that the, the underlying structure would provide, on my view, would definitely vary by jurisdiction. Because it would be it would be linked to all kinds of historical qualities and political qualities. So I, I would definitely agree with that. But the lowest level of specificity, the specificity is highest, is very contingent. So Noah, I think, as, as you said, though, is a very similar uh, line of thought, uh, taking it maybe um, a different direction a little bit, about whether the account I'm describing is law outside of politics. Um, and, and, and you kind of open by saying that my view describes law or maybe what I would call the underlying structure of law as being apart from politics. Yes, and so that's the way in which what I'm describing still is anchored in something like formalism and like positivism. Uh, that's what I'm trying to hold on to to resist, not, not to say it doesn't have its place, but to distinguish maybe from a more purely sociological or historical account or more political account. Again, not to say that that's not useful and valid in many ways, but that's exactly the separation I'm trying to maintain, while also in various ways accounting for the political contingency, I guess, in the ways that the, the Jacobs question uh, got at as well. Um, you had an interesting comment there also, it's almost an aside, about whether I thought that being conservative in itself led to certain kinds of legal views. So I had not been thinking about it that way, partly I think because I agree with the thing you made explicit earlier, that being conservative or liberal is a, itself a constructed political category. And so you, know, you see this sometimes, for example, kind of trivial when people who are on the right in some sense say, I'm a classical liberal. And it's kind of like a, a, a trivial example of that kind of recoding over time. Um, so, so I don't think I want to make that kind of claim, but it, it is interesting because I think there is some reason to think that formalism is correlated with certain personal and psychological traits, I think. And so if, if that's the case, there may be some correlation there between like, the raw fact of, of political inclination and the raw fact of jurisprudential inclination. I hadn't really thought about that before. I didn't think I was making a claim about that, but that is something Interesting that I, I like to think more about maybe and maybe learn more about uh, empirically. Uh, finally, on the last comment, so how, how can we be the true Hercules? What does it mean to be the true Hercules? So I think that part of what this, the, the argument or framework I'm setting out provides is that at some point, where you situate yourself within the structure at any given moment is not itself dictated by the jurisprudential or legal theory that I'm describing. So there's some kind of non-legal step that, that still has to, has to come in at critical moments. And that might be a pure moral um, conclusion. And so it might be that, that, that uh, if you're willing to include that kind of pure moral uh, conclusion as part of jurisprudence, that would convert my view into something more like Dworkin's view. And it would, it, would, it would result in my conceding that there is one true answer, which is the thing that, I'm, that I don't want to concede, because I'm trying to hold on to something more positive and formalist than that. So under my framework, then what's, what's the answer? What's, what's the one true Hercules going to do? Well, it's going to be, for me, the one true Hercules for this person in this place, in this institutional situation. So for example, Justice Barrett, who I talked about at some length here, the, the right thing under my account of law for her is different from the right thing for Kagan. So like, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to think that Justice Barrett, because I didn't find, uh, despite her valiant efforts, her conclusions very persuasive, I think she should have just said, I don't believe in the major questions doctrine. And I, I would view that as a legally superior thing for her to do. And for Justice Kagan, I think what Justice Kagan did was completely legally proper, but I don't think it was the only legally proper mode of engagement she had available to her in that case. So there is a sense in which my framework leaves a lot of indeterminacy still in what law is while also bounding it. But bounding it not in the first order level of what is legal or illegal, but rather bounding it at this like more abstract level of what are the configurations of legal views that are acceptable, mutually compatible, mutually antagonistic, etc. Other questions? I have Jed, uh, I have Rachel, uh, and I have Eunice, uh, and we'll come back to Neil in the next round. Great, Rachel, I really appreciate your um, Herculean efforts of generosity. Um, I was with you entirely uh, with, with Justice Barrett on um, being unpersuasive. Um, and I'm trying to understand how her simply writing a concurrence is an exercise of the rule of law. Right? If, if it's so fundamentally inconsistent and unpersuasive, uh, forgive me for being ungenerous, but it seems like you're getting a, a, a trophy for participation. 
Um, if, if, it, if it's not persuasive, if it's, if it's, if it's inconsistent with their other writings, um, why, why are you, well, I think it's appropriate to think about generosity in different contexts. I'm curious about why you're making such a Herculean effort to be more generous in this case. And I also would invite you to talk about in this context of generosity. What's striking about Biden versus Nebraska is the mutual uh, assured destruction between the, the, the language and tone used by Roberts and Kagan was deeply problematic, especially Kagan. Because we all know that there was a theory of standing that she might not agree with, but it's valid, in fact, I think correct about state standing. Liberals have endorsed state standing. Instead, Kagan says to Roberts, you are violating the Constitution. That escalation of rhetoric deserves to be Criticize, or if she's going to engage in that degree of rhetoric, rhetorical um, attack on Roberts, I think it raises some questions about um, uh, uh, the, the, where we're at in terms of the reform. So with respect to the task of legal scholars, I understood you to be saying that as legal scholars, we can expose the complexity of legal issues, and that can help people find common ground. And so I was just interested in examples of how we can do that. So my question was about structuralism and sort of the sense in which you're using structure as an object of structural inquiry. I'm specifically wondering, you know, is this about uncovering legal meaning? Is it about uncovering legal reasoning? Is it about uncovering legal culture? Uh, and then related to that, or I hope related enough <laughs> to be just one question, uh, is just, uh, you know, what if, with, by way of background, I'm also trained as an anthropologist, and one of the reasons structuralist thinking has fallen out of favor in sociocultural studies is because theorists found that it boxed in, uh, you know, that it was too restrictive in terms of not accounting for change over time. So one of the great things about structuralist inquiry is it allows you to take a snapshot of given structures in a particular time, but it gets you less in terms of understanding, you know, change over time for where you might go in the future. And so I had a question about whether structuralist thinking or that sort of analysis, you know, would, do you see a way that it gets us to understand evolution both from the past but also projecting into the future? And my apologies for that was two questions. <laughs> Okay, uh, wonderful. So uh, on, on, on Barrett, am I giving Barrett a trophy for participation? I, I guess kind of. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess there are degrees of criticism available. I mean, part of my whole point is to, is to recognize gradients and not just binaries. And so there are things that Barrett could have done that would have been, in my view, legally worse. Um, like, for example, continuing to just join these opinions without comment, that would have been legally worse. Also, giant, signing on to a more um, constitutionally clear statement you think that would be legally worse. <coughs> On the other hand, I think as I think you both agree and I've made very clear, I think there's something she could have done that would have been much legally better, which is going to say I'm not doing this. Uh, or, or come up with a legally appropriate reason for changing her uh, prior rules. I want to be clear that I'm not against people changing their minds about things, but the, the reason for the change of mind has to be kind of the system of work, internal to the rule set that the person had at the beginning. So, so uh, yeah, I'm, 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 you know, Justice Fair was once a professor, I could have attended this this conference at a different timeline. Uh, she could be, uh, she should have been among us. And you know, I'm disinclined to grade someone who not only is a justice, but more importantly, was a constitutional law professor. But I would guess I'm giving her a B, I guess, on the, <laughs> on the, on the, standard, on the standard of law. Um, uh, but I want to hold on. Yeah, I want to hold on to that being different from the other grades. Um, and so uh, on the other point, I, I wonder on the point because I was, I was being kind of positive with Kagan before in, our, in the prior exchange. But yeah, I mean, the, the, part of the reversal here goes both ways. And you're, you're put very forcefully the idea that Justice Kagan's antipathy to the standing logic in the Biden case is comparably problematic to the majority's embrace of the standing logic in the, in the same case, right? Because it's, it's, it runs both ways, in other words. Uh, and so I, I do think that's problematic, and that could be maybe a, a way of running a similar critique on Kagan that I, that I ran against Barrett. So I think it's a helpful example of how ubiquitous this, this dynamic is. Um, so Rachel, you asked me for example. So I, I, I hate to say this, I'm gonna I think I've seen examples at this conference. I mean, is that, is that too starry-eyed? I mean, have people, have people been on panels today? Yes, I know that some people 
said, you know, banal positive things, and some people said, you know, we agree totally or we disagree, maybe said banal negative things. But I, I'll speak for myself, I, I don't want to name names here in, in this situation, but I've seen people make responses in response to pushback here that I view as fruitful in this room at this conference, which is a, one of the great things about um, Andy and other folks at uh, this great institution putting it together. So I think like, Maybe even some of the Q&A today, is that too positive? I don't know. So I, I'll think of some better examples that are maybe, they, we can maybe, uh, maybe <laughs> help with it, yeah. Um, on the third thought, so I have to think a lot more about this idea of structuralism as you described it. So I don't have a, a well worked out response um, as yet, but I want to think more about it. I, I am a little unsure how to code work my project along the structure dimension as you're using, as I think you're using that term. Because part of what I'm trying to claim is that the structure is the thing that shows us the change or informs the change. So in that sense, I'm talking about maybe there's like multiple, like when I was talking about degrees of abstraction before, maybe that's just like structure, I hate to say it's a meta structure, I don't know. So I think I need some sort of less jargony way to capture that idea, and I think you're alluding to a body of, of thought that I, I should be more familiar with to try to do that better. So thank you. Thank you to everybody for these remarks. Okay, so I have Neil in the queue. Other questions? Okay, Neil uh, and Kevin uh, and David. Uh, so, Richard, I, I was with you until you started talking about what scholars can do, uh, illuminating the underlying structure of the law. The, the optimistic part. I lost you at the optimistic part. I just literally had no idea what that means. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I just don't know what it means. Um, um, so, uh, you know, can you give some examples of what the sort of underlying structure of the law is that endures? Right beyond um, you know, changes. Well, let me. So this is a kind of version of Rachel's content. Can I just some directly? So I'm sorry. What is your name? What is the question about uh, Kate before? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Oh, Jen. Oh, great. Oh, great. It's good to see you in person. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I know you from the from the Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, Jen. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so thank you. Thank you so much. Before I ask my question, so I hope I get an opportunity to ask you. Go ahead. Oh, go for it. I'm sorry. I thought that was a question. I want to hear what you have to say, but it really wasn't, um, it wasn't just about that. It was about what, uh, what scholars could, what, what other things scholars could do that I think I do understand, right, and I'm surprised you didn't mention, which is, you know, modeling different behavior than who we think of as the worst behaving judges and justices, right? Like, how about making admissions against injuries? How about remaining relatively consistent even when we don't like the outcome? Uh, how about right, not necessarily answering the one big question, yes or no, depending upon who's in control of the court at this time. And we can model it for our students, we can model it for other academics, and we might be able to model it for a justice to maybe have courage when it really matters that they wouldn't be the only one and wouldn't just be howled down from their quote unquote side if, they, if they're willing to speak law to uh, you know, the enormous political pressure that they're under. Because there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, I don't want to interrupt you again, though. Uh, uh, and, and especially because what, what actually happened there is you posed this challenge, I thought, and then if I had not interrupted you, you would have then answered the challenge for me, <laughs> which is very helpful. So I, I, I co signed all, uh, all of your wonderful thoughts That's there. by illuminating the underlying structure. <laughs> Oh, I see. see I, so I think that you're suggesting something that is helpful, consistent with my framework, that's not illuminating the structure of law. Yeah. yeah. So, so the example that's more, in, more along that specific uh, you know, avenue of, of improvement, so I'm going to go back to, to, to the exchange I had with Jed, is I think that one way to understand what happened in the Biden case is, uh, you can imagine law students, like I, I taught that case, uh, I guess, last semester, and you can imagine a student reading that case, if they're kind of fresh to the topic, and thinking, oh yeah, Kagan is so right. She's She's got these, these harsh clapbacks on Roberts. You can imagine somebody can say, oh, Roberts is so right. He's got these great clapbacks on Kagan. And, and there's a sense where someone could actually believe that, and at least for a while, if they're kind of new to this. But, but then I, you know, I think it's part of the job of professors, independent of my project, to say, actually, listen to what Jed is saying. And this is a little bit, a each of them is being like historical, and each of them is exaggerating things. And actually, if you, you know, rewind the tape a little bit, you find them in Mass EDPA kind of saying the opposite thing. 
uh, which is interesting, to put it mildly. And so that would be an example of showing, and then you build on that to explain well, why is that? Why, did, why was Roberts at the center of SVPA, but in the majority in Biden, and exploring that kind of shift? That would help to be an example more along the lines of illuminating the underlying structure. But I still want to co-sign all the other things you said, even if they don't fall within that particular uh, uh, tab. We have time for one more. Why don't we get two others? Oh, great. Okay, good. Uh, and it's uh, Kevin and then David. Yeah, but we're going to go a little bit over. You started a little bit. Oh, great. Five, five, ten feet. Have question. Great. Okay. Uh, I'll ask a quick. So, um, I have two. Just a couple. Um, so, so one one question is. Just, I'm very curious. Can you describe the various defensive major questions are as mild. I'm just curious why you see that as a mild form of major questions. So it seems like people need to judge power and pressure. That's so just. And then I guess maybe the more important question is kind of following on the same line about like, the different models of scholarship. So I guess I'm also struggling to understand a third way. So uh, it, it is so there's descriptive, there's advocacy, and there's third way. So if descript, uh, descriptive, I take it, I think you're trying to sort of like empirical or something, but if you think descriptive is a broader category, I wonder if that includes a bit of what you're describing as third way. Or if you say sort of um, no, like, uh, what the same that with the text kind of like more normative work in a way where we're we're making judgment about like consistency. Then it just sounds like advocacy, but the value is consistency rather than some kind of crucial value. So like I'm just trying to understand how this whole part. And the data. Thank you. I think I'm with a lot of people. I think that was just an amazing uh, mind opening. I really appreciate it. So just forgive me if my question is even off date because I the premise might be wrong you could just say so, but I, as I understood part of the structure, well, one of the rules of the game in the structure is once it's self-referential, like <coughs> judges maintain consistency with their worldview or their viewpoint or, or how they treat the law in the past. Is that right? That's so, part of me. Oh, yeah, right. It's part of one of the things. And so what, how does your uh, idea of the structure handle a judge whose structure is they don't have a viewpoint? So that the rule for that judge is they can basically just follow their political, whatever they want. I mean, so that's like the first half of the question, but then to put it in context of some of the comments about uh, Barry and even Kagan, and, and even people like just even going back, I, I wonder if we could throw in psych psychology and emotion and retribution and a feeling of unfairness when the perception, it, a lot of these comments are driven by perceptions of the judge, that the other judge is not, if they're making it up as they go along. Um, and so that judge either is not or not making it up, but the perception's there, and the frustration is, is the emotion that's coming out that's either paying but for the price for the past, you know, like other, you know, liberals in the past would have said that, but it concerns the past almost irregardless of even particular judges' viewpoint. And so I just put it out there and see if you have any thoughts on that. Okay, wonderful again. So uh, thank you everybody once again. Um, so Kevin, you get, get two um, comments. So one is why do I think Barrett's view is mild? And I, I maybe I'm being too um, trusting or naive here, but Barrett, Barrett tries to contrast her view with a, a, a Gorsuch style fair statement rule and uh, seems to be, I, I barely explicitly I think, but maybe, maybe I'm over reading this, to be saying that, that the kind of Thumb on the scale that she's describing for lucid meaning does, simply does not pose as high of a clarity threshold in her view as a clear statement rule. That's consistent with her writings, also some of her uh, uh, statements that are all argument are consistent with that view. And I think somewhat corroborating that read of her opinion and uh, reading it as meaningful is again, Kagan did not say Barrett is doing the same thing and Barrett is, is indistinguishable. Kagan latches onto the Barrett concurrence and says, This is thoughtful, this is more consistent with my view than you might think. And I take that to be an acknowledgement by Kagan that, 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 that something, was, something was seated there. Uh, but you know, maybe Kagan is, is uh, subject to false consciousness or, or something like that, so I, I can't rely on that completely. And so it is possible that I am uh, too optimistic, perhaps, in understanding Barrett uh, kind of at her word and as, as Kagan seems to understand um, uh, what he's trying to describe there as contrasted with the Chris Saber rule. And on the point about the descriptive and advocacy thing, yeah, I, I think you're I think you're right that exactly how we characterize advocacy and descriptive stuff may cause those very broad, extremely broad analytic categories to partially overlap with my sensible third way. And so I, I think you're you're just right that I would need to be more careful in saying that 
The third way is either a type of descriptive account or a type of advocacy, as contrasted with others, or to describe description and advocacy in ways that just exclude this kind of deeper structural inquiry. So I, I take that to be a, um, an app criticism of the conceptual structure that I was using uh, there. Um, so on the last thought about um, what if a judge has no, no, nothing to be consistent with, right? So I think there's one version of that which is kind of a pragmatic approach, which I, I would view as a kind of principle, but some people may include that as, own, as not having a principle rule. But I think the version of, of that hypothetical, literally having nothing to be consistent with, that's pure whimsy or hackery. That's the exact thing that I'm trying to say the legal system has not descended into, and that we should be very grateful it has so far not descended into. And so that's, that's the kind of the failure that, that, that my account would identify as the bad outcome, uh, the, the one bad outcome or something. Um, and you had this commentary about psychology and emotion and unfairness. And I, I think there's, there's a lot to that that, that I, I should think about more and unpack more. I mean, there is a sense in which the desire to be kind of zealous and, um, and to believe that you're the true Hercules, you're aspiring to the truth, that's an important thing that I wouldn't want potentially deep structure to eliminate. I wouldn't want people to be so sophisticated about this, that they become, about law, that they become disillusioned or apathetic about law. Um, I want people to have views and defend those views and so forth, and that's part of the fuels of consistency. Um, and I also think that there's a, a good point related to that, which is that no matter what professors do and try to under reveal the deeper sophistication or talk about what's going on in, in um, the Biden case, it could just be that people who are in litigation at the moment just have trouble adopting that more disinterested, dispassionate perspective. And that may, that may suggest a kind of pessimism about my optimism on the third way. That, you know, I, I, I keep saying it's optimism. I mean, you know, I have that, that metaphor I try to draw out of the two sides passing in the middle of the aisle and looking into each other and seeing sympathetically each other's eyes or something like that. But you can easily imagine the two sides crossing in the middle of the aisle and the greater intimacy does not foster toleration or whatever. It fosters like an easier attempt to smack the other side. So, so there, there, there is a kind of like, empirical uh, question of uh, that comment is what triggered it for me. <laughs> that, well, that moment right. where you're seeing um, they're looking at each other, I'm seeing hate, like, oh, like they hate each other, or there's like this, this emotional thing coming through at that moment of contact. Yeah, you might even think that the moment that the two sides, the two factions most begin to resemble one another, the premium on each side demanding that each side view the other as the opposite and maybe worse than the opposite maximizes, and you kind of like irrational flashing out at that moment that may not occur if you can say, well, you're like that, I'm like this, we're obviously different. Whereas if, if the difference is not so obvious, maybe we need to kind of, yeah, that, that's a more pessimistic take. <laughs> <laughs> any, any remaining questions? Uh, you, Rich? So, I know we've been talking about Barrett and Kagan. What do you make of the exchange between Justice Thomas and Justice Jackson in Students for Fair Admission versus Harvard? Do you think those are constructive dynamics, finally putting out a plurality of views about racial justice grounded in sort of black American experiences? Do you think it's bad for the court that they are going after each other in their opinions? What what is that a constructive generated constitutional moment? Ooh, uh... I think we need to think more about those opinions, uh, have a thoughtful view on that. I tend to think that from this, because it, it, there's a broader question of whether it's good rhetoric or good form of judicial behavior apart from my framework, but I think if I just try to limit to my framework here, so setting aside a lot of other possible reasons for being concerned uh, or, or praising of the exchange, I think there is something, uh, I dare say a little good about it, uh, which is that it does seem that Thomas is being Thomas, and Jackson is being Jackson, and they're being their authentic, for themselves, principled versions of themselves, I think. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong with that. Maybe if I thought more about that, that, that wouldn't be true. But notice, neither one seemed to be saying, you're not playing by the rules that I adhere to. Each side seemed to be saying, you're playing by the wrong rules. And I think that having that kind of crystallination is, it, 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 let me put it this way, it's not as bad as, as the, the, the hack. It's not as bad as the whimsical judge who has nothing to betray, I think. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.